Hello, everybody, and welcome to an empty grass field. No, it's another exciting tech tutorial. Today, we'll be covering the nuclear reactor, one of my favorite things in the game, as it has the potential for catastrophic failure without the risk of hurting anyone or anything. And when you can blow things up without risk of life and limb, it's always good. Now, I have shown this particular configuration before in my EU tutorial, and when I got bored and started blowing things up. And I also use it in my Shenanaderp series, but I haven't put that on video yet. In this video, I'll be going over the steps it took and what I learned to find that this version works best for me. First, let's start by looking at what it takes to make one of these. This is what it takes just to make the reactor chamber, the central component that is the base for the entire project. This doesn't look like a lot, one could probably mine this in one or two Minecraft days, but we have to add on the integrated heat dispersers, the reactor plating, the uranium cells, and the coolant cells, which I haven't shown here. It's basically exactly like this, but it's water instead of uranium there. Now, compare that to what it takes to make one solar panel, and we see that it's significantly less. Why would you spend all that time manning out the stuff required for the reactor when a solar panel requires so little and won't explode on you? That's a damn good question. A solar panel only outputs one EU per tick. To get it to output any kind of real power, that would mean several hundred times the amount. Yeah, doesn't look so bad anymore now, does it? This is the reactor chamber itself. It is the central component where everything else branches off of. If you plunk it down and then right click on it, we get our basic storage area where we can put all our things. Now this isn't a, a lot of space. Um, if you're good, you can make pretty good use of this space, but not really. It doesn't. It wouldn't be able to output enough power and keep everything cool. That's why they have these. This is the reactor chamber. Well, let me make sure of this. Yes, reactor chamber. I get confused sometimes because I call this side the reactor chamber because it's the chamber where the act reaction occurs, but Tekkit calls it the nuclear reactor, and this is the reactor chamber. But anyways, uh, we attach that on there, and we can see that we have an ent entire another column. Now we can add more of them, and we can see we even have more columns. We can do this up to six times, and the sixth time, of course, being the one on the bottom. Here, and now we have plenty of space. I think that's the same amount of space as an iron chest fairly sure anyways. So plenty of space to put stuff in. But let's start simply. Let's start with one nuclear reactor, attach an MFSU to it so we can measure its output, and then we'll put in just one uranium cell. Now before I do that, I want to show how to turn off the reactor. And that can be done simply by giving it a redstone signal. Now you can do that quite literally by plunking down a lever right on the reactor or any of the extended reactor chambers. Or you could run redstone wire to it. But either way, once you get a redstone signal, an active redstone signal to the nuclear reactor, it will shut it down. This way you can put things in the reactor and it won't run just yet. So once you get to the more complicated designs, the bigger designs, the designs that are at risk of exploding, you can put everything in and then turn it on. It's just a good safety measure. But, so we got one uranium cell right now. So let's turn this on. It 
interesting. It started raining the sex the exact second I turned on the reactor. Okay. And we need our handy dandy EU reader to see that we are outputting 10 EU per tick. Cool. So let's turn this off. And then we'll go into the inventory and we'll add a second uranium cell. Then we turn it back on. And we use our handy dandy EU meter. And we see we're doing 20 EU per tick. Okay, so that makes sense. One uranium cell, 10 EU per tick. Two uranium cells, 20 EU per tick. But some of you out there, some of you quicker people out there, might have noticed that I didn't put them side by side. And I did that to show something. So two uranium cells, not side by side, outputs 20. But if we put them side by side, still two uranium cells, and we now have 40 EU per tick. It doubled what two not by side by side uranium cells did. And there's a trick to that. Um, the nuclear reactor runs in cycles, and it will output 10 EU per tick for one cycle. But adding another uranium cell adds a cycle. So it, if it's like this, it's doing two cycles instead of just one. But it also increases when they touch. And the more that you have touching, the more cycles there are. So that's why it, far away we had 20, which is two cycles. Put them together, we have 40 or four cycles. Now, the more cycles you have, the more other things it can do. Like, it cools off based on a cycle basis as well. But, of course, it also heats up on a cycle basis. So we can see how this can get quite confusing. There's a lot of math involved, and I admit I don't fully understand it. And I don't even try to. I just try to make something that works. But that's how it is. So that's two uranium cells side by side. Let's see what three uranium cells side by side does. 70 EU per tick. Okay. And then four, all in a nice square. Gives us 120 EU per tick. And I think I found a glitch. Oh, there it goes. Okay. And you see that I turned that off real quick. Now, there's a reason for that. And to show that reason, I need a thermometer. In this case, a digital thermometer. There is a regular thermometer in the game. Probably easier to make. Oh, I did that again. Silly me. glass, water cell, iron ingot. Yeah, that's not bad. That's kind of easy to make. But it runs like all the other tools where it takes damage, whereas the digital thermometer recharges. And not only does it recharge, it actually gives you more information. A regular thermometer only gives you the temperature, whereas a digital thermometer gives you the water evaporate temperature and the melting temperature. Now we can see my hull heat is 766. That's pretty high. Not dangerously high. Dangerously high is somewhere around 8,000 because at 8,500, it's a meltdown. It, it explodes on us. And we can see that the, temp that the temperature is actually dropping. And that's because the reactor casing will bleed off heat over a, pe a certain period of time. Well, let's take a look at that. How do we bleed off heat? Because obviously, this is just four uranium cells. How do we bleed off the heat from the uranium cells and still, so it doesn't explode? 
obviously there has to be a way to do that because what use would this be if you have to turn it off every two minutes just for four uranium cells? Well, for that we need coolant cells. And what coolant cells do is they sit directly beside a component, in this case the uranium cell, and pull heat off. Now for every coolant cell it can also dissipate a certain amount of heat over time. So right now our hull heat is still dropping and just for consistency let's let it drop the entire way. It'll take several minutes of course I'll cut it for you guys. And once it's down to C zero we'll start our cooling tests. And now the reactor has properly cooled itself. The uranium cell obviously hasn't changed its uh, damage, I guess you could say it, but that's because that's not a heat rating. That is its use rating. It will gradually drop as it's used and eventually disappear. Now, a coolant cell put right there will help keep the system cool. So if we turn this on, we can see that the hull heat is still zero. But that's because all the heat's going right there. And the heat's going right there very rapidly. That's because one coolant cell does not dissipate enough heat from one uranium cell to keep it properly cooled. To do it properly, you need four. Four uranium cells, or four coolant cells for one uranium cell will stabilize the temperature. We see how it's not going up anymore. It's also not going down. It is completely even. If I shut off the reactor, let it cool down to zero, it will stay zero. This is now a stable Mark I reactor. Now that Mark I means that it will run constantly. I could kill off this uranium cell, replace it with another one, and keep it running without ever having to shut it down for a cooling cycle or anything like that. Obviously that's not too terribly practical because we are only outputting 10 EU per tick. I mean, our MFSU is... there's barely a dent in it. But now that we figured out how to keep one uranium cell cool, let's try for two side by side. Because obviously we could keep two uranium cells cool just by ha moving this collection down one block and then repeating it up here. And then two, side by, two not side by side is easy to keep cool. But let's try to do two side by side. Now, two side by side is a little bit more complex because one, well, one, we're out of coolant cells, but one, you can't have four per uranium cell because there's only space for six total. We would need eight. And that's going to take a long time to cool off, but I'm not going to worry about it. So obviously, if we turn it on now, these all start gaining heat. Now another bigger problem is that two uranium cells side by side actually produce more heat than two not side by side. So two not by side by side would produce four heat per cycle, which eight coolant cells total could take care of. But two uranium cells side by side produce even more heat going with the what's been uh, happening. I would guess that it's actually, we would actually need 16 year coolant cells to keep it properly cool since everything else seems to be double. But let's see what we can do by adding another component. That's this component right here, the integrated heat disperser. 
Now, the integrated heat dispersers are confusing, to say the least. What they're designed to do is they're designed to absorb heat and distribute it evenly with the parts around it. So if I put an integrated heat disperser there and then put two coolant cells there, we can see that it's already doing its thing. It's going to balance out as best as it can all of the coolant. And we can do that here as well and balance it out across three. But of course we still only have three. Now another thing we can do with it, and I'm going to pull all of these out of here just to show it off, is that we can put another integrated heat disperser away from the rest. This is something you cannot do with the coolant cells. The coolant cells has to be touching something that it can cool, like an integrated heat disperser or a uranium cell. The coolant cells have to be touching the one of those, but the integrated heat disperser can, it will disperse heat across heat dispersers. We see how even though they're not touching, the heat from these two are going up here to these three. And if I turn on the reactor, right now, if everything is working like I think it does, we have five coolant cells cooling one uranium cell. And this one's dropping, so once this drops and evens out, in theory, all of these components should actually start losing heat. Though they're not. They're increasing heat, but it's only one uranium cell. See, this is how we learn. We test a theory, and we find out that it's wrong, and then we figure out why it's wrong. Let's add another coolant cell. Now, this coolant cell also has a lot of heat, so we gotta wait till it stabilizes. Coolant cells do not lose heat if they're in your inventory. They only lose heat if they're in a reactor chamber. We're not losing heat as I would expect we would lose heat. But we're also not gaining heat either. Anyways, to get back to the point, to cool two uranium cells, side by side, we have to use the heat dispersers. That's the only way we can do it. And we don't want the heat dispersers touching each other, because as I said, they will absorb heat and then disperse it between the components around it. So right now, this will disperse heat into this disperser, and this one will disperse heat into that disperser. It becomes a weak point in the reactor chamber. So what we have to do is separate them. So this uranium cell will be cooled by this integrated disperser. This uranium cell will be cooled by this, or this uranium cell will be cooled by this integrated heat disperser. Now we also need other integrated heat dispersers. And if we throw one there, and let's us throw one here. still not much. It's only six. And what I really, really don't want to do is have one coolant cell touching two dispersers or touching a uranium cell and a disperser because that's that would mean the coolant cell is absorbing heat from two different sides and it just degrades that much faster. So what we got to do is be creative in how we make these and not let it work. Now, these integrated heat dispersers also disperse heat, or not only disperse heat, but bleed off heat over a period of time as well. So this may work, or at least it may be faster. We'll 
Let's find out. See, now we are gaining heat. It seems to be just about as fast as when we were running with just six. But that's where these come into play, the reactor chambers. We can use them to add space. And then from there, we have this much more space to keep things cool. So we can move these apart and put four coolant cells on each. Which of course, I'm out of coolant cells again. But coolant cells are easy to make. Four tin water, so you make a water cell and then run it through an extractor. So coolant cells are easy to make. And then we'll do one more. And then we end up with 12 coolant cells for two uranium cells. Now, if my theory is correct, this will not work because I theorized that we would need 16. So that would make four more, obviously. So, give that a test. And we can see it's dispersing heat. I would expect it to do this. Even if it worked, I would expect it to disperse heat. seems a little slower, but I might be a little mistaken on that, but it does seem a little slower, in parts anyways. So let's test my theory, let's move these over, and yeah, that should work. Uh, we have four cells, but I need another disperser. them while I'm at it. Throw the disperser here, the four cells here, and that makes 16. So in theory, this should work. We see it dispersing heat, and a good way to tell that you have a relatively good setup is that it, disper it starts to di disperse heat evenly, the yellow lines show up evenly. Like how it's not showing up there until much, much later is actually probably not a good thing. Now it's working, but it's working much, much... Well, it, it, it's not working but it's working better because it's slower. It's gaining heat significantly slower and we're keeping heat off the hull. We're still gaining heat on the hull, but we see it's also gaining significantly slower than even when we just had one with no coolant. So now we have to be a little bit more creative in how we disperse these. Obviously 16 coolant cells is not working. So here we have a setup with 21 coolant cells. And if I have everything set up right, no coolant cell is touching two separate dispersers. Yeah, that looks right. So we got 21 coolant cells, so let's turn this on. how well it disperses the heat. It seems to be gaining heat extremely slowly. And 
every now and then it will do this. Um, the, a nuclear reactor becomes more efficient the hotter it gets. So, while you may gain heat, once it gets to a certain point, it might actually stop gaining heat. Once it fully balances. Just really got to keep your eye on it. As of what we see right now, this would be a pretty good Mark II nuclear reactor. A Mark II nuclear reactor eventually has to be cooled down, but it has to be able to complete one full uh, run of uranium cells. So if these deplete the entire way and have to be replaced before any of the components fail, it's Mark II reactor. But this might end up being a Mark I reactor once it stabilizes. So what I'm going to do is leave that on. I'm going to turn back on the sun. Is let this run for a little while and see if the heat ever, see if the heat production ever stabilizes. Well, so far the reactor hasn't stabilized. But it's gaining heat at a significantly slower rate. So there might be a point higher up where it stabilizes. But as of right now, I'm just going to qualify this as a Mark II and be done with it. As we can see quite clearly, the uranium cells are dropping faster than any of the components. And I did manage to cram one more coolant cell in here. But yeah, we're still gaining heat. But it's extremely slowly. So I would mark this as a Mark II and call it a day. Now let's see if we can get it up to a Mark One. We'll add all of them now. Turn this back off. And now, with the extra two columns, let's see if we can do something with them. I think that at this point, I have the most efficient use of space that I can. I may be a little mistaken on that. But I don't think I can see anywhere where I can cram any more cells in without them touching other cells. And I don't want to do that because that would create a weak point in the system. So, let's turn this on and see what happens. You can see the heat dispersing fairly quickly throughout the system. This is a good sign, for the most part. I'll have to wait, let it run, see if it stabilizes. Alright, well, I've been testing it for a little while, and it seems to have stabilized with a hull heat of 9. And it's not going up. So, I think this qualifies as a Mark 1 now. So, there we go. It took 31 coolant cells. Now, I could probably have done that easier by adding the third component of the reactor. That is the integrated reactor plating. Now the integrated reactor plating has the ability to absorb heat, pass it along in one jump to other integrated reactor plating, adjacent integrated reactor plating to be specific, and it will help disperse heat. So if I properly use the integrated reactor plating, this might be a little less confusing. And if we're going to want to add a third uranium cell, we will definitely have to use the integrated reactor plating. 
the integrated reactor plating also has an added benefit of adding to the strength of the reactor chamber and making its melting point higher. Now that the system is entirely cooled off, what I'm going to attempt to do is use the integrated reactor plating and add a third uranium cell. Now this is going to be hard. I don't think it's possible to make a Mark I reactor with three uranium cells touching. It's definitely possible to make a Mark I with three uranium cells not touching, but to do it with them touching, I don't think it's physically possible, at least in this version of IC2, but I'm going to try, see what I can see. This particular design I wanted to point out to you guys because it is a failure. And not for the reasons that I thought it would be a failure. If I turn it on, everything seems good. It's dispersing the heat around the system. That's doing pretty good. And the coolant cells are staying relatively cool. I mean, we're gaining heat extremely slowly. And that's a very good thing. But there's a reason for that. It's because all the heat is going right here. It's not getting pushed off anywhere else fast enough. So I think this particular design is a bad design. Uh, I'm going to qualify this as a horrible failure. I don't even think this could qualify as a Mark III, which has to be able to run through 10% of a uranium cell before one of the parts fails. I think this may qualify as a Mark IV, which would be able to run through 10% of a uranium cell, but I would have to replace parts because they would fail. Yeah, I don't think it's making 10%, not with that kind of heat. So, I wanted to point at that out because it is such a... Uh, epic failure I guess that would qualify and I will definitely need to think of something else in this particular test I kinda just went ape and threw everything in wherever I could and wherever I couldn't I threw in reintegrated reactor plating just to see what would happen and let's find out spreading the heat out pretty good. There's nothing instantaneous that strikes me as going to fail miserably. Obviously the reactor plating is worthless right now because it's not absorbing any of the heat, but that's not too terribly surprising. Okay, that's absorbing a lot of heat right there, this cell. That one's absorbing a lot of heat as well. Hmm. I think something might have come from me going ape like this. Because while these two are absorbing a lot of heat, It's not that bad. I think we may have learned something here. Hmm. Let's check the hull, see what it's doing. Oh wow, we're only at a hull heat of 9, 10, 11. We're raising pretty slowly. I still don't think it qualifies as a Mark II. But we're doing surprisingly well, actually. I I'm quite impressed with myself on this one. I'm mildly curious. What happens if I do this? Absolutely nothing, it would seem.
Why isn't that absorbing any heat? Let's see if we see it. Oh, there it goes. Now it's absorbing some heat, just not a lot. Ah, here we are. And that's probably because of the integrated reactor plating right beside it. It's sucking up the heat real quick and sending it off in one direction. Basically away from itself. Okay, so that's what integrated reactor platings are designed for. They're designed to take heat that's right beside it and just push it off somewhere else as fast as physically possible. And if it can't push it off that fast, obviously it takes it itself. Now these are actually cooling because they're pushing heat off somewhere else. So let's see if we can track down what component is absorbing all of this heat that's coming from these guys. So far, I don't see it. So let that be a lesson to you guys. Poke at it and see what happens. Sometimes you'll learn things. Now obviously if you're playing with a real nuclear reactor, like in real life, don't just randomly poke at things. Uh, that would be very, very bad. I would recommend you at least read the manual first. But if there's no risk of blowing up and killing thousands of people, hey, why not? There's no risk at all. Why worry about poking at something? Never be afraid to try. Let's see what our heat's doing. 49, 50. You know what? Let's let this run for a little while and see what happens. Okay, I think this particular test went on long enough. We can see that the uranium cell that we have just put in there is definitely dropping its usage much faster than these are gaining heat. Now they're still gaining heat, and while it's extremely slow, the hull is still gaining heat. So that still makes this a mark two as it will eventually need a cooldown period but it will most definitely make it through an entire set of uranium cells easily possibly even two now personally this is good enough for me i would be quite content with this particular setup but we could make it better we could make it what's called a mark one sec at least i believe that's the proper acronym Basically, it's external cooling. And that's a perfect segue into external cooling. And how do you ex cool things externally? Well, it's not by actually cooling it on the outside of the hull. It's by putting something else into the reactor. Something like ice. Now, you can throw ice into the reactor, and it will cool off the reactor by 300 degrees. Now, obviously, we're nowhere near 300 degrees. It's going to take me a long time to gather up enough heat for that proper test. But all you have to do is just throw the ice in wherever you have free space, and it won't absorb heat from anything around it. But when the reactor gets up over 300 degrees, it will use one of the ice blocks to cool itself down. And depending on how many stacks you have in there, and how many uranium cells you have in there, you can cool it down even faster. So let me set up a quick example for that. 
So now all we have in this reactor is three uranium cells and three stacks of ice. And the temperature is zero because there's nothing in here to hold heat. So all the heat went away real quick, real quick. So if we turn this on, we can see that the temperature rises pretty damn quick. But we also see that it fluctuates greatly. And that is because it's using the ice blocks. So depending on how many stacks of ice you have in there, this can run for an extremely long time. In fact, it could possibly run longer with just stacks of ice than it could with all of those cooling cells. And since all it takes to make a block of ice is a snowball in a compressor, well, it just kind of makes running a nuclear reactor just that much easier. And when I accidentally stumbled upon this little thing, I was just kind of shocked. Uh, basically what it was is I was just fiddling around, placing things wherever they go, trying to find the most efficient way to do things. And then I'm like, oh, well, why don't I just add some ice that would keep it a little bit cooler. And then eventually I said, screw it. I'm bored with this. Everything's going to blow up. So I took out all of the coolant except the ice. Turned it on and then ran away. And then I stood there for like five minutes waiting for the thing to overheat and blow up. And then I came back, it basically looked like this. You know, obviously there was less ice at the time, but I'm like, wait, 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 how hot is this thing? I'm like, oh, oh, holy crap. All right, so if we could use ice to keep this cool, how far can we go with it? And then I started fiddling with it. Basically what I had was I had a row of ice at the bottom of my reactor. And then started to throw more and more uranium cells into the reactor to see just how far I could go. And it's fairly easily to tell just how far you can go because once you run out of ice, that's a problem. But as long as you still have ice, you're not really in trouble. So basically, and once you get the uranium cells, or once you get the uranium this isn't that hard, but I could definitely see how getting the uranium is kind of a pain in the butt. But I mean, look how many uranium cells we have. And if I turn this on... Well, one, I just blew up the MFSU because I was outputting way more than 512 EU per tick. And I didn't have a high voltage transformer. But I mean, look how much... It's just using these stacks of ice. And yeah, the more uranium in here that's touching the more cycles per tick you have and the more cycles that you have the more external coolant you can have now I've got to be extremely careful because once these run out it heats up pretty quick you can see that we're using one two three four five six stacks of ice and sometimes a seventh well once this stack goes away we still have this stack to play with but once all of these stacks go away or even just these five stacks it eventually starts adding heat faster than the ice can cool it off because we can only use one ice block per cycle. And I'm going to turn that off because we're getting low on ice. Now, if we have if we can use one ice block per cycle, but we have multiple cycles per tick, well, at this point it's multiple cycles per second. It's not really multiple cycles per tick. Um, so if we have multiple cycles per second, then, well, we use multiple blocks of ice at once. And that will cool off the system faster than it can heat up. 
So if we can use a grand total of seven, that means we can use two more uranium cells and push out just that much more power. But, you know, it's best to have a buffer, I guess, if you really were... It, if you're really going to squeeze out the power, you can do it. And that's what I recommend you use my kind of setup. But there is one more kind of external coolant that you can use. And that is the water bucket. A water bucket will evaporate when the reactor hull reaches 4,000 degrees. But it will only reduce the heat by 250 degrees which it's actually shown in the wiki for basically manual adjustment of the reactor's temperature or just as a hint that the reactor is overheating. So I guess the water bucket isn't designed for a cooling system. It's designed for the breeder-style reactors, which run hot because of how, how they work, what they're designed to do, which I will not be covering in this video. Um, they're more des they're designed just to be like okay you're getting a little too close to overheating so let's drop it by 250 degrees so we won't be using the water buckets in our experiments even though for the most part our experiments are over but this also begs the question can we just make this easy well since my server doesn't disable EE, yes, I can make this extremely easy. So let's get started building a reactor that's going to be self-sustaining. That way we don't have to worry about it overheating or anything. We just turn it on, it does its thing, it outputs a buttload of power, and we never have to worry about exploding. And to do that, we have to combine a few different mods. Particularly, of course, industrial craft. We'll have to combine uh, build craft and equivalent exchange. And I believe the energy link is a third mod designed to combine industrial craft and build craft. These are the components you will need. You will obviously need the ice. You will need a mark three collector. It has to be a Mark three collector. Mark two or a Mark one will not be fast enough. You will need an energy condenser, and these are combined to basically duplicate the ice. You will need a wooden transport pipe and at least two cobblestone transport pipes, depending on how you're going to build this. That way you can pump the ice from the energy condenser into the reactor. You will need the energy link, which will act as an engine, but it's faster than the engines. It's faster than a, definitely faster than a redstone engine, faster than a steam engine, faster than a combustion engine. And it runs off of industrial craft power, so we'll power this from the reactor. So when the reactor turns on, this turns on and starts pumping the ice into the thing. We will need the HV transformer to take the power from the reactor and turn it into high voltage. And then we will need a medium voltage transformer to take that power and turn it into medium voltage. And then we'll need a low voltage transformer to turn the medium voltage into low voltage. Now to be the most efficient possible, we will also need a bat box. And then that way we can make sure we're only outputting 64 EU per tick into the energy link. Because if you just plug the low voltage transformer directly into the energy link, the energy link can suck multiple packets per tick and still use more EU than we want. But we want all our EU going towards whatever we are powering. So just to be efficient, let us normalize the power output and just have the battery, the bat box. We will need a some form of stone to create a pool underneath the reactor. 
I use reinforced stone because this is a reactor and around reactors you use reinforced stone. Just a habit of mine. And you need at least two lava buckets to fill said pool. And let's get started. The first thing we'll need to do is create the pool. Actually, the first thing I need to do is turn back on the sun. I really wish that the set time to day that's in the options actually worked, but it, for some reason it doesn't. I can set it today and the sun will still set. We need to clean out, clear out a 3x3 three three block area. And then we're going to fill this 3x3 three three block area with the reinforced stone. And then we're going to put more blocks around it to create a you know, recessed area. Obviously, you don't have to do this with reinforced stone. You can do this with anything to sand, dirt, just as long as it doesn't get destroyed by lava, you'll be fine. We put a platform in the middle so we can create the reactor on top of it. We get the reactor, which <laughs> I don't have in here. We need all the reactor parts, so we need the re nuclear reactor itself and six reactor chambers. We can't just put the reactor chamber down on here, so we put down a block of dirt, and we put the nuclear reactor on top of it, and then once we break the dirt, now we can put the reactor chamber on it. Just put the reactor chambers all around it. That way you have access to all six. And I just realized I forgot something. One of the most important things you can possibly have on a reactor. And that's an off switch. Now, you can do this however you want. I do it normally just by plunking down a lever all right on the reactor. Now, I'm not going to fill it yet because I'm just not worried about that part yet. Now, take your two lava buckets and put it in opposing corners. And then the lava will flow and cover the entire thing. Now, you can fill the entire pool if you want to make it smoother. And possibly even help with frames per second. Though, I don't think six blocks of flowing lava is really going to hurt anything. But, you know, it might. I'm not sure. Now we need to output the power, and that's where the HV transformer comes in. We plunk it on the reactor, and you can do that by holding shift and then right-clicking, and that will let you put it directly on the reactor without actually opening the reactor. And then we use our trusty wrench, hold shift again, and right-click, and that will put the input side on the opposite side of what you're clicking on, so now the input side is actually touching the reactor here. So the power will come through here and then out its output sides. This will not hurt the reactor since, if, since one of the output sides is on the reactor itself. It won't hurt it. And then from here we do the same exact thing with the medium voltage transformer. And then the low voltage transformer. Seems like that sheep almost wants to be suicidal. Go away, sheep. You don't want to die. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Then we take our bat box and sit it there. Okay, so this way we have EV power coming out of the reactor into an HV transformer turning into HV power, and then medium voltage, and then low voltage, and then getting stored in the bat box so that we have constant power coming to the energy link and then we just plunk the energy link right there no wires involved and then we dig out a hole right here to put the collector into and then the energy condenser right on top of that you may as well throw your chunk of ice in there right now so you can have all the ice ready when you're done 
and then you run your pipes just like you would normally run build pipes. You put the wooden out output pipe and then the cobblestone pipe. Shift click. That way the ice can be pushed up, across, and in. And then from here, all that's left to do with the reactor is fill it with uranium cells. So what we do is we fill the reactor up with uranium cells and do it up onto this row. You want to leave this row empty, and I'll show you why in a sec. The reactor is now as full as I'm willing to risk anyways. So what do we do with the rest of the space? We go over here and we pick up nine stacks of ice that we have already been preparing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we take those stacks and just fill the rest of the reactor. That way the reactor doesn't overheat and explode while we're waiting for the energy link to fill the bottom row of the reactor. And that's it. The reactor is ready to go. And you have a side right here that you can attach a wire to to be outputted wherever you want. So if you want, what I normally do is a bank of batteries of MFSUs, so a whole bunch of MFSUs. And I do this for a reason. The more MFSUs you have, the more power you can output simultaneously. So like if you're running a mass fabricator, the mass fabricator can suck that much more power. Or if you want to upgrade a macerator or an electric furnace or whatever, the more MFSUs you have pointing directly at the macerator, the more power you have at once. I put up this wall of macerators not to just show you what you can do with the power, but because these mace there's no way that that reactor can output enough power that these mace that these MFSUs can't input it. So what goes over this wire is literally the max that this reactor can output. So if I turn this on, we can see the ice is already up and doing its thing. We can see inside of it the ice is being used, but this ice will get there fast enough to fill up the used. And there it goes, and it will fill up the entire way. It'll only take a couple of seconds. And now we can see exactly why we have the lava there. And that's why. Because if you don't have the lava there, that ice will just float there. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blocks will fly out of this thing. And you'll cause serious lag, and if you're on a server, potentially crash it, making it so that it cannot be recovered. At least this particular area can't be recovered. Uh, I highly recommend you don't do that. So, let's get our handy dandy ureter, and let's see how much power we're outputting. We are outputting... 1931 EU per tick. Slightly fluctuating. Not by much, though. But it's fluctuating because of the bat box. Because the bat box will absorb the power only in packets, and then output it in packets, so it can get a little confused. So I wouldn't worry about a little tiny fluctuation. That's another reason why you have a bank of batteries here. So that... Uh, it, when you actually output your power into something else, the power is stabilized. So we can see that these MFSUs, 
because we have so many of them, because the output of the reactor is spread across just so many MFSUs, they're not charging that quickly. But they will all be charged well before that thing turns off. And then with a little creative red power, you can actually teach the thing that once all these MFSUs are full, that will turn off. And then once these start draining, that will turn on. Now, it took me a little while to figure out how to do that. But it's not something that I'm going to show in this video, because it's complicated and I haven't actually tried it to see if it would work. Now, a few interesting little points about the nuclear reactors. Okay, technically it's about things associated with the nuclear reactor. One. The digital thermometer, we can see that it's running out of power. It can be charged regularly, like in an MFSU or something. Just throw it in the upper part and it will charge. But a glitch is if you take a digital thermometer and throw it into an alchemy bag with a talisman of repair, it will actually charge the digital thermometer. I guess the alchemy bag thinks it's damaged and needs repairing. As far as I know, that's the only thing that t requires power that will do this outside of, say, the sonic screwdriver, which seriously took me looking it up on the wiki to figure out how to power that thing. But that's something else entirely. But the wrench, that will repair like normal because that's just a tool. The electric wrench will not recharge in the alchemy bag. Another interesting little thing, and this is a very, very important thing, is that all this information I just gave you, while still poignant in the current version of Tekkit, once the next version of Tekkit comes out, it will probably be mostly worthless, or at least horribly incomplete. Because looking things up on the wiki, I learned something very interesting. Industrial Craft has updated. And from what I can see, it's made the reactor that much more useful. Now we can see I'm outputting 1900 EU per tick. With fiddling, I could probably get it up to over 2000 easily. But that's not that much. I mean, with 4 MFSUs, I can do that. 20, 40, 80 EU per tick right there. And it takes up less space. Of course, that takes a lot of resources to do, and it's a giant pain in the butt. The nuclear reactor is a very good intermediary. However, in the next version of Industrial Craft, we won't just have uranium cell. You'll have a single uranium cell, you'll have a dual uranium cell, and you'll have a quad uranium cell. So, basically, it's like four uranium cells in one square. So we can output that much more power. Ooh, I'm excited. I can't wait. We also have upgraded cooling systems. We'll have upgraded cooling cells. We'll have upgraded dispersers. We'll have upgraded reactor plates. And we have ventilation fans as well. Oh, the next version is actually going to be quite fun. I can't wait. I believe that's all for the nuclear reactor. Obviously, I didn't go into insane detail about how everything interacts with everything else. You know what? Just go out and play with it and give it a try yourself. Do it safely, of course. But that wasn't my goal. My goal wasn't to teach you every single possible thing. My goal was to teach you enough that you can feel confident and go out and play with it yourself. So if you've never played with a nuclear reactor, have at it. It's quite fun, and it's an accomplishment. Hey, I have a nuclear reactor that outputs 1,900 EU per tick, and it won't blow up. How many other people can say that? Not many. And believe me when I say that, there's not many that can do this. Well, of course, now there will be, because I've shown how it's made. So, as always, keep playing the game, and have fun.